So we are talking about buy truth and do not sell it. And the next thing that I bring to your attention is 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, which we are going to call refuse to tamper with God's word. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2. And I suspect this will be the entirety of the lesson because there's actually quite a bit of information here now. If not, we'll move on to the parallel passage. A little bit surprising. And that's what's fun about it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, though, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but rather by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. The apostles have, you know, given up the old things. They refuse or uh, uh, renounced the disgraceful underhanded ways they are refusing to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. They will not walk in this. This is not their habit. It's not their practice to do these things. And so we look at the things that are being said here um, fairly closely. Disgraceful here is shameful and underhanded is actually hidden things. They're hidden things. So stuff that's being hidden. It's being kept back or held back. They're not being straightforward, if you will. Somebody who's being underhanded in this way is not being straightforward about what they're really about. The apostles are being straightforward. They refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. Let's look at refuse to practice cunning. This word for cunning. Oh, this is not being shared, is it? Sorry. For those of you who are online, I apologize. I meant to be sharing the slides with you. You probably cannot see them from there unless I do this. All right. Let me get back to... So in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, we have the word cunning. We're going to look at this. What does it mean? Well, you know, our our dictionary is beginning to show its age. And uh, so now and then you look up a word and you get something like knavery. <laughs> That's pretty good. So I kept it. But it's uh, adulteration, whether of drugs or of honey. Uh, knavery is trickery, but more than that, it's you set about to do something that is not right. And this is actually a word that comes from uh, Han Urgos. So Urgos is, uh, is Wurgos, that's work, that's activity or action. And Pan, like, uh, like uh, Pantheon, you know. The, the all it's so it's all action all work which means ready to do anything i think that's chilling and yet that's exactly what it means there are people who are ready to do anything whatever it takes you know maybe you would say the end justifies the means or perhaps you would say um yeah, whatever it takes, we're dedicated to the cause, but the cause is evil. But ready to do anything, meaning it doesn't have to play by the rules. It doesn't have to be expected. It doesn't have to be right. It means you're unprincipled. There are no principles. There are no absolutes. There's nothing that's off limits. I think that's chilling to realize what it means. Um, so when the apostles say we refuse to practice cunning but by open statement of truth would commend ourselves yeah they're saying we are not ready to do anything we are principled in the truth not anything goes 
So now let's look at this word where it happens in other places to give you an idea. We looked at the dictionary, which is useful. Um, and that's why we put it here. But really, the scriptures are the best way to define terms. And so we look at Luke 20, verses 20 to 23, where this word occurs. And I think you can understand quite clearly what the meaning is. Here, the leaders of Jerusalem are watching Jesus. It says they watched him, sent spies who pretended to be sincere so that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they're, they're pretending to be sincere. They're not sincere, it says, so that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the governor, meaning they're not actually sincere. They're saying what they think will get him in trouble with Rome. They're trying to find a, a reason to call Roman authority against him. And so they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? He perceived their cunning. That's the word for cunning. What they're doing is craftiness or cunning. It means they are ready to do anything, and they are. They're going to do whatever they can find, anything they can use as a pretext to put him in front of Rome on trial. That's what they're trying to accomplish. Look at those words. Teacher, we know you speak and teach rightly. You show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. You know, I mean, they might as well say, and, and uh, you know, you do Bible things in Bible ways. And if there is anything you see amiss among us, we invite you to be our friend and let us know where we've gone wrong in the Bible, right? You hear this at every church in the land, and almost none of them mean it. Almost none of them mean it. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Well, what does that have to do with the law of Moses? Nothing. But he perceived the craftiness. You see the cunning of it. They're trying to get something done. There's a false premise. There's a false discussion here. They're not actually discussing anything. They're not actually asking anything. They have no legitimate inquiry, no concern about spiritual matters. There's no question in their mind about what they think they should do for Caesar. All of this is made up for the purpose of getting him in front of the court. That's what it is to be cunning or crafty. And the apostles refuse to do this with the word. They're not saying one thing and doing another. They're not making up a story or making up events, uh, a narrative so that they can bring about an action that they may think is justified or right. In 2 Corinthians 11, this word appears, verses 3 and 4, where Paul said, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if somebody comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one you uh, or that we have proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one that you have already received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, well, you put up with that readily enough. He's afraid because they let this stuff fly. And this is said to be the devil's cunning. The serpent is cunning. When he went to Eve, you may recall in Genesis 3, he said, did God really say you cannot eat of any tree in the garden? He knew that God didn't say that. This was all a pretext. It was a lie. It was trumped up to trip her up. It was the whole point. It wasn't that he didn't know. It wasn't that he had her interest at heart or anything like it. 
This was all just a pretext for murder. That's the cunning. And the reason Paul's afraid for them is because, well, they let people come and say all kinds of things. A different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. And this is okay. But Paul, well, you know, he's not a great speaker or his words are very heavy. Excuses. In Ephesians 4, this occurs as well. Only here, this is how we avoid it. How do you keep from being tricked in this way? Well, there it tells us that God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. That's the point of these things. The apostles, of course, wrote the Bible, as the prophets did. Evangelists is what we have today, as well as shepherds and teachers. In any congregation, there should be someone whose work is to preach the gospel. There should be overseers, elders, shepherds, and there should be teachers of God's word. And these are equipping the saints. You are to receive the equipment you need to do the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. With the result in the 14th verse that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. There is our word, craftiness in deceitful schemes. That's the thing that is, yeah, the lies, the made-up narrative thing. It's just not true. It sounds good, though. And somebody who is unaware or unsuspecting may buy into that and, and start thinking about this when they really should dismiss it out of hand because it's not real. So the apostles, if you will, and prophets, the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers are responsible for giving the saints the equipment they need to no longer be children, tossed to and fro. You should have the tools you need not to be tricked by these kinds of schemes. Let's see. The other thing that we saw back there in 2 Corinthians 4.2 was we refuse to tamper with God's word. And that bears definition as well. It's another chilling thought in my way of thinking. This word is defined in the dictionary, beguile and snare, take by craft, that is by trickery. We would say perhaps uh, cheat, to cheat somebody. But it also is used as a disguise something, adulterate something, make an alloy which is more than one metal, you know. Maybe it looks like silver, but it's actually silver mixed with something else, which means it's less valuable than its weight. But you don't know that, right? Dye something, so it's not the color that, it's not actually the color that it appears to be, right? This word literally means bait for fish. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> bait. We refuse to tamper with God's word means we refuse to use bait for fish when it comes to God's word. And this is, that's a literal meaning, but then that means that it gets used for cunning contrivance, deceit, or catching like a net. For example, the net in which Hephaestus catches Ares. Or a mouse trap. This is the word for a mouse trap, right? But it's bait. So bait gives way to trick or stratagem, which gives way to an abstract idea of craft, cunning, treachery, espionage. 
But that's the idea with temper. It's bait and switch, what we call it. Bait and switch. <laughs> We're coloring it. We're dyeing it a different color. We're saying it's something that it isn't. It's actually diluted. We're, um, you know, what are the other things? Uh, let's go back. Yeah, adulterating it, disguising it, making it sound nicer than it is or making it sound meaner than it is, right? You're cheating. This is what they're refusing to do. And as an example of this, we can take Mark 14, 1 and 2, where it is recorded, the authority, uh, it's recorded there, two days before the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him, for they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. So they're trying to do something very public, in public, without it being known what they're doing. That's why the word bait for fish is used. Because if you want the fish to bite, you don't put a metal hook in the water, right? You put food on the metal hook. And they are just eating. When one of the things they bite, bites them back. That's the end. It's not what they intended. It's not what usually happens. They had no idea. They had no concept of what was happening or going to happen when they took that morsel. So it is the chief priests want to kill Jesus without the people realizing what's happening. They don't want the people to know what they're up to or what they're trying to accomplish. Their agenda is hidden. That's called bait and switch. They put out that it's one thing, and because that seems to be palatable to people, and when people come, they find out it's not exactly that. It's actually this other thing. You don't do that with God's word. And here's one that's a little more difficult, but I think is worth looking at. Second Corinthians 12, when we speak of tampering or bait and switch, baiting, the apostle says these things in his own defense because the church there is questioning his authority, his legitimacy. He tells them in 2 Corinthians 12, 14 to 18, here for the third time, I am ready to come to you and I'll not be a burden for I seek not what is yours, but you. What he means by this is he's not going to accept payment from them. He is being paid by Thessalonica, or I'm sorry, by uh, Philippi rather. He is being supported by Philippi. You can see that in Philippians 4. I'll not be a burden. I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend to be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Is it offensive to be called children? Maybe. Should they be adults by now? Should they be supporting him by now? Probably. Probably. Philippi hadn't been around much longer, and they were the ones who were faithfully supporting Paul, not because they were wealthy either. But granting that I myself didn't burden you, as in you guys, even if you admit that I took no direct payment I was crafty, you say. I got the better of you by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? Ha! So I didn't take the money, but I got the money anyway by other means, indirect. You paid somebody else who came, and they funneled the money to me. That's the accusation. Did I take advantage of you through any of those I sent? I urged Titus to go, sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Didn't we act in the same spirit? Didn't we take the same steps? Yeah, they did. They did. 
Nobody took support. No, no faithful person took support in Corinth in those days. But their thought is, well, this was, you know, this was bait and switch. You showed up and said you were going to take no pay, but actually you did. Because when we paid this person or we, whatever, sent money to this, whatever it was, that you took some of it or it went to you. So you told us you were taking no pay, but actually you were getting it from some of the people that we were paying. That's the accusation. That's bait and switch. And as he said, well, I didn't take anything. I sent Titus. I didn't, he didn't take anything. There's nothing to that accusation. It's baseless. How about First Thessalonians? I find First Thessalonians a very compelling parallel passage, and I think we'll take the time to read this at the moment. Although um, there is another that we will look at that is the most compelling. This one's good, though. And it does deal with tampering, bait, because in First Thessalonians 2, 2 through 6, he tells them, though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, that is to say, in public by the authorities. That's where they were put in jail, remember? They were beaten and put in the stocks. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. It said back there, if you recall in Acts 16, that the Philippian jailer washed and bound up their wounds. They had been beaten. So when they got <laughs> to Thessalonica, they were bandaged up and bloody and bruised. <laughs> if you can imagine these guys hobbling into town <laughs> and speaking the word, <laughs> that's what happened. They said, you know, we were treated shamefully, but we came and had boldness. For, why is that? Because our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. That's debate. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people. Whether you or others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but that's a reference to their support. But the 13th verse continues, you remember, brothers, our labors and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Uh, I'm sorry, that's nine. Um what were your witnesses and God too? How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you who believe? So when they showed up, they were preaching not for personal gain, obviously, as they hobble into town, bloodied and bandaged. What happened to you? Well, we preached this message in Philippi. <laughs> so you came here to do it too, huh? Why would you do that? Well, because it's the truth. And they worked to provide for their own needs. They didn't take support from these people. So then the 13th verse, we thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is. The word of God, which is at work in you who believe. So it starts with, you know that we had no uh, reason to speak this word. We have no self-serving reason to speak this word. It goes to, you saw that we worked with our own hands. We did not take support from you. We did not take glory. We did not take money. We took nothing. You know that we conducted ourselves completely above board. With the result in the 13th verse, that this word that came by us, that is, you heard it from us, you accepted not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. 
the word came through because they refused to tamper with the word. They refused to bait and switch. And they refused to do whatever it takes <laughs> to be ready to do just anything. That's not the kind of people they were. They were principled. They believed and they held the truth and they stayed firm in that conviction. And the result, again, is not that they themselves were glorified, although we speak of them in some sense as glory. Uh, as Paul said, let us, you know, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him who glories, glory in his shame. You know, it, if I'm going to boast, I'll boast in my infirmities, what he said. Yeah, in some sense, we look at that and we say, "That's these guys were pretty good. They were strong. They paid a lot, and they held the line. But really, the point of it was that the word they spoke was not their own. It was God's, and that's why it was so important to put it out there. And that's why they would not dilute it or uh, alter it in some way, mix it with something to make it palatable. Nor would they change the agenda or be less than truthful about what they were about or what they were calling on us to do. They did, they did none of those things. And the power of God's word rested on Thessalonica because of that. They received it. And it was powerful with them. They did what was right. And they supported the gospel. They're the messengers who brought the money from Philippi to Paul at Corinth while he was there. which is recorded in 2 Corinthians. The brothers who came from Thessalonica supplied my need. I took nothing from Corinth. But the word of God is what it really is. And that is the thing that is in work, at work in those of us who believe. So that's why when we say, buy the truth and don't sell it, we're saying refuse to tamper with the word the way that the apostles refused to tamper with it. Instead, by open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everybody's conscience, that is, to everything that anybody else could know about us, and also in the sight of God. This is what is right and how we ought to behave ourselves. All right. Well, that is the end of that study. We talk about obedience to the gospel when we come together as the children of God. Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you realized that you are in need before God, that you are standing before the judgment seat of God to give answer for the things that have been done, whether they are good or whether they are evil, and decided or seen that you have been wrong, you have sinned, that you need to change, and that God is right? It's time, then. It's time. Repent. Make things right with God. It means you change. You become a new person. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. That puts to death the old person of sin. And lets you ra be raised from the waters the way that Jesus is raised from the grave. A new person. A Christian, a child of God. Having your sins forgiven. And having Jesus as your mediator with God. There's an umpire between us. And that's Jesus. Today, are you a Christian? We'll help you to obey the gospel. If you aren't. But if you are a Christian. And you need the prayers of the saints. We'll pray with you for you. We, nobody hears above temptation. Nobody hears above sin. We'll help each other on to heaven. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let your need be known now at this time when we sing the song selected.